Anything that one man is capable of imagining, other men will be capable of making a reality. It's been almost two years since researchers at Langley began developing a vehicle capable of horizontal landing. These lifting bodies, as they are commonly known, derive their lift from body shape alone. By the mid-60s, success of the lifting body concept led to the development of several research vehicles. At Ames Research Center, the M2 project was under development. The first M2 vehicle was actually towed across the desert at roughly 110 miles per hour by a stripped-down Pontiac. Eventually, the M2 designs, as well as the Langley design, the HL10, were being loaded into B-52, taken about eight miles up and launched. The HL-10 was the most successful of the lifting body. It exhibited acceptable transonic and supersonic handling characteristics and eventually became the fastest and highest flying piloted lifting body ever built. Although it was built without landing engines, the HL-10 still performed well. In fact, its landing capabilities contributed to the decision to eliminate the engines from the space shuttle. While work progressed on the shuttle, the HL-10 was put on the back burner. But recently, that blunt body design has been undergoing a refinement and redevelopment process now known as the HL-20. It is no longer simply a research vehicle, as the research being conducted on the HL-20 has a specific purpose. I believe that if the United States is going to have a space program, that uh, the presence of humans in space play a very large part in the success of that program. And so the importance of having an, uh, the ability to transport people to and from space becomes uh, an absolute requirement. Our main objective has been to use the HL-20 design as we have it today to show that the lifting body as a type of vehicle would be usable in the PLS function. What we have done is to take the lifting body and really go through it in, in significant detail. And the research, if you will, that we've done on this, you know, really quantifies the capabilities. We do a free flight testing here. The free flight test, you fly the model on a tether, tether and you program in control laws, and you, therefore you're able, you're able to study all the characteristics of the airplane unrestricted because it flies on the tether. This is a low speed facility. We normally test most small models, which uh, this HL-20 over here is a small model. It's a 20% scale model. We are measuring normal force, axle force, pitch, rolling moment, yawing moment, and side force. Using the six component internally mounted strain gauge balance. Balance is mounted on the center of gravity that we want the data referenced about. We measure a large battery of data to support simulation studies. I think the research we've done has been extremely important because it's helped to determine the configuration that hopefully will become the full-scale configuration all the way through the program. A group of us was responsible in the beginning for developing a geometric description, that is a mathematical model uh, of the configuration, to be used uh, subsequently for various analyses such as aerodynamics and structures, as well as to, uh, you know, to provide a guide for the people building a full-scale mock-up. For the HL-20, we uh, actually received it from uh, a small model that had been built for wind tunnel tests. And they uh, took actual measured points from that model and gave them to us. And we put, made it as part of our mathematical model. And uh, that was kind of our rough data. And then from there, we kind of made the surface a little smoother. And things that are easier to do on the computer. Uh, the fate of that, of that data is that it's used uh, in other analyses. We can give it to an aerodynamicist and they can take that uh, geometric description and straight into their computer programs for calculating the, the aerodynamic forces 
from the view. And uh, we can uh, use it to generate templates or cross sections for the people who are actually building the, the full scale mock up. What we've been interested in uh, to this point has been the aerodynamics of the vehicle. And to that end, we've basically dealt with uh, inviscid solutions, but what we've done is included the chemistry, flow chemistry, into the calculations. One of the things that is always a concern is the effect of the gas chemistry on the aerodynamics and heating. One of the things we're really interested in looking at was the high mount number, high altitude aerodynamic characteristics of the vehicle. And for the PLS, what we found was that due to its configuration, it appears that gas chemistry doesn't have a significant effect on the uh, aerodynamics. If, it, say, a PLS were being built, we may have the capability of generating uh, information, say, that a commercial firm can't. Uh, or doesn't have the resources to do so there may be that we may do some things and feed them information uh, that's been the, the history of a lot of uh, of these type projects if you don't do it step by step if you just do one great big iteration then you don't understand or don't know which one of your modifications really work not how small it needs to be is how big can you make it you always want to make it as big as possible so you for accuracy purposes, but you have to take into account since the, the wind tunnel is a constrained wall uh, capsule type thing and the air is going through, you have to watch for shock reflections, you have to watch for blockages, and so there's only a certain size that how large you can make a model will go up a certain wind tunnel. And see, since we have to cross the speed range from say three tenths landing conditions by number, the 20, then you want to size a model that you can get as much data across that speed range as possible. Now this, this small scale, of course, is for testing at extremely high Mach numbers like your 18,000 miles per hour entry condition. And of course the tunnel shrinks the faster you go, so the model has to get smaller too. I have to take into account how much volume they need and the seating arrangements. And what I do then is wrap an efficient aerodynamic shell around that as efficient as I can. In other words, volumetric efficiency is just as important as the aerodynamic efficiency. We'll feed the data into the simulator and let the guys fly for comparative purposes. By using the simulator we can uncover things that might need to be looked at from an aerodynamics standpoint or from a structure standpoint. Things possible problems that need to be fixed. The feedback I get from our research pilots is extremely important. It's, it's really why we're doing this simulation. Pilots like to be able to see the runway environment where they're trying to land. Uh, so we provide a display that tells them some key information that with proper sort of optics will actually appear as if it's overlaid on the runway. First thing we learned in the simulator is the original HL-20 the 3.2 LRD, it was possible to land it. The second thing we learned was it had fairly good flying characteristics. We also learned that it was stable. That led to an investigation in the wind tunnel, which ended up with some aerodynamic improvements, and we ended up with an airplane that had an LRD of not 3.2, but actually 4.3. And sure enough, went back and the simulator with the improved aerodynamics the vehicle. It does exhibit level one flying qualities or, or earns itself a level one rating from most of the pilots that have flown. In human factors, you're trying to ac um, account for people's capabilities and build the system around those capabilities so that you are uh, enhancing the system by using people, doing, using people doing what they do best and then also trying to compensate for what they don't do best. We're just looking at um, when people on their return and they were this vehicle lands in horizontal position block up the glider like a shuttle bus. Can they get out of it uh, quickly and orderly and safely if there had been an emergency upon land? So we were looking at that how quickly we could get out of it.
Now, because they were getting out of it, we also timed how quickly they could get in it, because they had to get in and get out. So we went ahead and measured that. The other part of the mission, I guess we looked at a little bit, was um, in terms of acceptability of the, the vehicle, in terms of its volume and, and how acceptable it was for people sitting close to other people. And in terms of um, the fit evaluation, we found that uh, we could pretty much fit everybody in there that we needed to fit. The only restrictions we had was on the last row of seats toward the rear of the vehicle. We can only put someone in there who's 5'7 or shorter uh, when they're in their flight suit. We found that uh, with the window uh, area that we had in the vehicle, that was sufficient for, according to our flight simulation data, for what people needed to be able to see out of the land. And we're finding we're basically using a combination of all of these rules in our raw nav state to compare it to the, the guidance. We're, we're flying guidance and we're, we're cross-checking uh, other instruments to see exactly uh, you know, if the guidance is giving us the correct information. In a lifting body or, or in, a, in a vehicle that's going to make a horizontal landing, um, if you have any type of features like wings, for instance, that, that extend from the, from the vehicle, uh, the, the reentry heating problem becomes significant. If you can make a vehicle essentially wingless where they're not small, thin uh, protuberances from the vehicle, such as wings or, or fins or whatever, uh, if you can take that away, then the reentry heating problem is, is um, mitigated. So if we can just have a, a, a wingless vehicle, we've solved a lot of the heating problems. Uh, and of course, then you get into the problems of making it landable. And that's what the work we're doing right here in the simulator is evaluating the landability of this, uh, of this vehicle. The simulator is going to be indispensable in actually letting us see how it flies and letting us change our flight control system as we decelerate through these mock speeds to, to better handle the uh, aerodynamic problems the vehicle inherently has. So if you, if you think of it as this uh, HL20, without any controls at all, you can think of it as it decelerates from Mach 4 to Mach 1. Uh, a lot of good or bad things happen to it from an aerodynamic gear view. And now our job is to tailor our flight control system to, to um, alleviate these problems and to make it you know, easily fly. The simulation study has, has uh, initiated significant changes to the uh, vehicle design, you know, all done for a very small cost. The HL-20 is, um, is not a replacement for the space shuttle and understand that the space shuttle is now the United States' method of getting or its way of getting people to and from space. The HL-20 has a hypersonic LRD, I'm speaking of, by the way, of about 1.4, which gives it a large cross range when it comes back from the space station. When it does the deorbit and actually flies in the atmosphere, it has a, an 1,100 nautical mile cross range, which is, which is about the level that the shuttle has. The other advantage is being able to land horizontally on a runway like runways that we have nowadays with the hl-20 it's simply a matter of hooking up a tow truck like you do with an aircraft and you tow it around an airport and tow it from the runway to the servicing facilities typical mission would require the uh, the uh, spacecraft or the uh, pls to be processed on its own and then mated with a booster or a launch vehicle on the pad and then the, uh, the mission operations would commence. The, uh, the booster would carry the spacecraft, the PLS, to the space station and rotate the crew, change out the crew, if you will, and return eight people or up to eight people back to the Earth. I believe we as an agency have learned a lot on what we can do and what limitations there are and so on. So I think it's, it's been a very good program. If it goes, that's going to be wonderful. If it doesn't, I think we've, we've really contributed.